Welcome to another episode of Investing Compass. Before we begin, a quick note that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature. It doesn't take into consideration your personal circumstances, situation, or needs. Um, So I have some incredibly exciting news. Well, it's exciting for me because it's very well deserved and long overdue, but um, Mark got a promotion. So now it's my turn to embarrass him. So now he's a director, which is very exciting. Yeah, so it's awkward for me. Yeah, <laughs> you did do this to me. Well, first of all, nobody knows. Yeah, well, it was the same with mine. What do you mean it was the same with yours? No one knew, and we told people on the podcast. No, no I meant nobody at Morningstar knows. Yeah. <laughs> because as soon as yours became official, mm-hmm. I sent an email to everyone. Yeah. But like my boss didn't do that. No. So, <laughs> so nobody, nobody knows. Nobody knows, yeah. And the other funny thing <laughs> is you were actually the one that told me about it. Yes. Because they updated all the systems, and she noticed that my title changed. In the system. So I found out from you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the whole thing's the whole thing's very awkward. Number yeah. one, that you're doing this, and then sort of the way that it happened, that it happened. as well. Yeah. <laughs> Should we get on with the episode? I, I, well, now that you've embarrassed me, I, <laughs> yeah. I've got a lot of things I can embarrass you about as well. But, you know, we'll hold off on okay. those <laughs> for next episode, maybe. But we, but, are, we are very proud of you. Well, thank you. That's very nice. <laughs> so... Our last episode, we talked about, we went through this scenario, right? So a scenario where we could find sort of where we are now and how that could lead into a bear market. And basically what we said is that, you know, there were pretty significant falls in small cap growth shares. And we talked about them spreading to large cap growth shares and then the various indexes that would start going down because they're overweight. All of these market darlings, right? So we talked about the NASDAQ 100 being the first to fall, and then the S&P 500, and how this would impact passive investors. So that, of course, was not a prediction. And as we said, I think, in that first episode, certainly not a wish of ours. It was just sort of an exploration of the makeup of the current market. And the whole point of this podcast is to take a thoughtful look at investing and not follow the daily, weekly, and even monthly gyrations of the share market. We've been quite vocal over the last year and a half that we've been doing this, that the market is priced at a historically high valuation level. That is a fact and not an opinion. And as we've said, uh, we have no idea what that will translate into other than to say that when the market is expensive, future expected returns are lower. Those lower returns can manifest themselves in a steep decline or they can simply result in years of below average returns. We aren't in the prediction business here because the future is impossible to predict. Yeah, and we don't want to we don't want to make all these episodes as you said just about what's happening in the market. Mm-hmm. But we also don't have our head in the sand, so we know what's happening in the markets. And of course, we hear from investors all the time through the webinars that we do, folks that listen to the podcast that email in and then comments on all these various investing boards that we follow. And, you know, there is certainly an element of the investing population that is very uneasy about what's been happening. And some of those investing boards almost have taken on a bit of a collective support function at this point. And so we do think this is, of course, is a good thing, because as we've said over and over again, the worst thing that anyone can do is panic. And, you know, we are proponents of having goals and a plan to achieve those goals. And the most important thing to do in times of stress is to stick to your plan. But the problem with some of these boards is that more and more people are taking advice from them, and 60% of millennials and Gen Z are using social media to make investment decisions. And for those that think this is just a bunch of teenagers, we need to remind people that this is the under 41 crowd, so it is a lot of people. Yeah, and we, we don't want to pontificate, right, on the wisdom of taking advice from anonymous people, because we do need to be serious. This has been happening way before the internet existed. So people have taken advice on what shares to invest in from just random people they bump into. And that's happened since the share market started. The problem, obviously, is that social media and the internet has taken this human condition of just seeking advice and put it on steroids. And we want to address two very specific pieces of advice that are being repeated over and over again that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. So anyone feeling jittery about what is happening and questioning this orthodoxy that shares only go up, is bombarded by calls to buy the dip, which of course is justified by saying shares are on sale. Needless to say, we are not enamored with this so-called advice. 
And yes, we know that part of this is bravado and that the people giving this advice are probably concerned as well. The first thing we want to say and talked about last episode is that it's okay to be anxious when the market falls. That's a natural reaction and the key is to channel that anxiety in a positive way and not to start to spiral. We will get back to things you can do at the end of the episode, but first let's start with this notion of buy the dip and why we think this is pretty bad advice. So why don't you walk us through that, Mark? Yeah. Okay. So buy the dip, which once again, we've heard on all these different boards. To me, that's a trading strategy. So trading, of course, is speculation, and that is different to investing. Is Investing is what the two of us do, Shani. And of course, it's what we're proponents of at Morningstar, and it's what this podcast is about. So investing is about having a plan and sticking to it. And investing is about purchasing assets for less than they're worth and taking a long-term view. Speculation is purchasing a piece of paper and hoping that someone else will pay more for it in the future. And this may sound like semantics, but anyone can be a successful investor. And very few people can and are successful speculators. So with that preface, let's talk about buying the dip. The concept here is pretty simple. You buy when prices go down. The problem, of course, is that nobody has defined the degree prices need to go down to count as a dip. And buy the dip is a trading strategy that works very well in bull markets. A bull market, of course, is when prices are rising, but those price rises don't go straight up. So normally you have down periods, but those down periods are always followed by another high, which means that if you buy after any dip in the market, you will get rewarded for it. And after a long bull run, investors become conditioned to the fact that after any negative returns, the market will just turn around and reach another high. So a fall in the market elicits this Pavlovian response from investors. Markets go down, so people buy. It's the same Pavlovian response, by the way, Shani, that Priscilla gets around those chicken treats that I got him. He does really like those chicken treats. Yeah. I went to Pup and Puss to get those. Yeah. <laughs> so I got Priscilla, while well, Shani had COVID and I mm-hmm. was the dog walker, I got Priscilla these chicken treats from this pet store in Surrey Hills called Pup and Puss. It was asking for forgiveness because Mark lost um, Priscilla's ball in the park um, because he's colorblind, so he couldn't see it in the grass. But I did. I did. And- that store, you know, you can buy a three hundred dollar dog bowl. In I feel that like store. Priscilla definitely would have forgiven you if you got him that three dollar, three hundred dollar dog bowl. You know, I've never eaten off of anything that costs three hundred dollars, <laughs> so I don't know if Priscilla needs to. Okay, so um, while any fall in a bull market is just a pause on the way up, the opposite happens in a bear market. In this case, each rally is a pause on the way down, so that buying the dip becomes simply a way to lose more money. And this is where we get back to this notion of how big the dip needs to be, and we can turn to market history. In 29 of the last 50 years, there has been a correction in the market, which is defined as a drop of more than 10%. As we record this on January 27th, the NASDAQ has corrected and the S&P 500 is flirting with a correction and actually reached it intraday before a rally, but hasn't closed 10% below the high. So the first thing to say is what has happened is quite common and has happened every 1.6 years over the last 50 years. The average fall in those 29 corrections has been 14%. And of those corrections that have occurred, only eight have turned into a bear market, which is defined as a drop of 20% or more. Those bear markets in the past 50 years have resulted in an average drop of 33% and have lasted an average of 14 months. So remember that 14 months is a relatively long time. We were about a month into the current volatility with the S&P 500 hitting an all-time high back in December. So it's important to have that perspective that if, and this is a big if, what we are experiencing actually turns into a bear market, we would have on average 13 months or of course more than a year to go. So buying the dip may seem like a good strategy, but in a bear market, it can become devastating because time and time again, you're putting more money into the market only to watch it go down. It is actions like that which will eventually break the will of investors and reach the phase that is so critical in every bear market, capitulation where you just give up. And it's this widespread capitulation that causes so many people to make the worst mistake in investing, which is to give up completely or to give up at the bottom of the market and miss the rally, which starts when, of course, it seems like there's only bad news and bad returns ahead. So let's go back to the GFC to illustrate this point. We can look at net flows into shares as a way to measure investor behavior. 
So that's looking at all the people investing in the market and all the people selling. So a positive net flow indicates more money is going into the market than going out. And of course, vice versa. In 2009, markets bottomed at levels that were the lowest in a decade. Investors in 2009 were net sellers that year, meaning the net flow was negative. So that's classic poor behavior of selling low. After this low, the market rallied significantly. So in 2009, after hitting that low, the turnaround started with the S&P 500 up about 23.5% for the year. Went up close to 13% in 2010, was flat in 2011, up 13.5% in 2012, up 30% in 2013, and then 11.5% in 2014. And it was only then, in 2014, that net flows turned positive again. So many investors missed out on all those returns when the market was around 90% higher than it had been during the bear market lows. And this is why timing the market doesn't work for most people, and buying the dip is timing the market. So the key here is to stick to your plan and not alter it because of a dip in the market. Altering your plan doesn't mean selling. It also means buying, and in this case, buying because we've had a slight fall, which is something that has happened once every 1.6 years for the past 50 years. And we don't want to do this because if this becomes a bear market, the change in your plan will be more likely to induce you to capitulate and give up, which is the worst thing that you can do as an investor and makes it really unlikely that you'll reach your goals. And as investors, we need structure to lower our behavioral risk, which of course is the risk of doing something stupid. A plan is structure and something to fall back on when your stress levels increase. So stick with your plan. Morningstar Premium is designed to help you reach your investing goals. Our coverage spans over 50,000 securities and 2,000 funds and ETFs. Sign up to a four-week free trial through the link in the episode notes to access our global equity best ideas for our top picks across borders. Find shares with sustainable, above-average dividend payouts and the best opportunities at home with five-star Aussie stocks. A Morningstar Premium subscription includes a ShareSide investor plan, allowing you to track all of your investment holdings in one place. And take advantage of ShareSite's investment performance and tax reporting that has been built specifically for the needs of self-directed investors. If you love premium after your four-week trial and choose to subscribe, your subscription may be tax deductible if you derive income from the share market. Sign up for a free trial today. Let's turn to the second piece of so-called advice we're seeing, and that is that shares are on sale. And these two pieces of advice obviously go hand in hand. Why are you buying the dip? You're buying it because shares are on sale. And shares do have a price, but it's not the one that you see quoted all day long. The price of shares is the valuation level, which is how much you are paying for earnings or cash flow or whatever other measure you want to use. And this is where we need to be careful not to confuse price and value. Value is what we are interested in. And as Shani said, that is the true price. Fixating on the prices you see quoted on websites without a corresponding review of value is another place that investors go wrong. So let's explore this concept of price versus value. And we're going to use Apple as, a, as an example. So the reason we're using Apple is because it's the biggest company in the world, makes up 6.5% of the S&P 500, makes up 4.8% of the MISCI Global Developed Market Index. And this one company alone is worth more than every company that trades on the ASX. So it matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it matters. So. <laughs> Through January 25th, Apple is down close to 12% over the past month. So Shani, is it on sale? All right. So let's start with our analysts. At the end of last year, we had a fair value on Apple at $124 and it finished the year trading at $177. That gives us a price to fair value of 1.42. We calculate that by comparing what we think it's worth, the fair value and what it's trading at. So at the end of the year, we believe that Apple was 42% overvalued. Since that time, the share price has, of course, come down, which gets it closer to our fair value. And now we have a price to fair value of around 1.3, which means we still think it's overvalued by 30%. And let's look at some other measures. So price to forward earnings is the P ratio that is using not what the company earned in the past, but what analysts think it will earn next year. So Apple closed the year at a forward PE of 31.65, and it's now at 28. Over the past five years, the forward P that Apple has been trading at has averaged 20. I could go on and on with different relative valuation measures. It is currently trading at a price to sales of 7.4, and the average over the last five years has been 5. The current price to cash flow is 26, 
and it's averaged 17 and a half over the past five years. So in this case, Apple, despite this price drop, is still trading at valuation levels that are much higher than they've been in the recent past. So for this one share, I would definitely say that it is not on sale. And as Mark said, this is one share. So let's pull back and look at the overall market. Let's take a look at the CAPE ratio. The CAPE ratio is a cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio and uses inflation adjusted earnings of the total market over a 10 year period, smooth out fluctuations in corporate profits that occur over different periods of a business cycle. This is Buffett's favorite valuation measure of the market as a whole. We ended last year at a CAPE ratio on the S&P 500 of around 39. To add some perspective, the only time it's been higher than 39 was in the dot-com bubble when it topped out at 44 in December of 1999. Based on the share price fall in the S&P 500, this year it has come down from 39 to around 36. Since the year 2000, the average monthly CAPE ratio has been 27, which means that the market would have to fall around another 25% at the current earnings levels to get back to average. Yeah, and that's just average, Johnny. Mm -hmm. So during the GFC crash, it got down to 13.3. So I don't think we can say that the drop we've had this year has put the overall market on sale. And the point of this episode is not to scare anyone, but it's to provide perspective. We hear a lot about zooming out to look at how the market has done over the long term. And zooming out is important, of course, because what has happened so far this year is nothing, a blip in the history of a market that over the long term continues to go up and generates wealth for long-term investors. But zooming out also involves adding perspective to the current valuation levels and how little this drop has impacted the market. It is still historically expensive. That doesn't mean it'll go down, and it could, of course, resume its climb higher. But what it does mean is that, once again, it is not on sale. We have an action bias as humans. It's our fight or flight instinct, and it means that when something is unsettling, we feel like we have to do something. Responding to market volatility by selling is a flight side of things. It's running away. But changing your long-term plan and buying the dip because shares are on sale is the flight side of things. History would suggest the best thing to do is to ignore these instincts that are telling you that you have to do something. Instead, do the same thing that you would do if the market hadn't moved at all this year. I'll get my paycheck on the 31st of January and I'll invest a portion of it. Not more than I normally would and not less. And I'll do the same thing on February 15th when I get my next paycheck, regardless of what the market does. You really think you're, you're staying employed for the next couple of weeks, right? <laughs> I have at least a four-week notice period. So. <laughs> that is true. That is true. And same thing as Shani. I'm not changing or deviating from anything I've been doing. I consider the fall that we've had so far as inconsequential to my strategy of putting some of the cash I've built up to work when prices are cheaper. The market falls dramatically, then there will be some opportunities. If it rebounds, I'm still confident that even with my cash levels, I will earn the 6.3% return that I need annually over the next 18 years until I want to retire. So we're both sticking to our plans, and we would suggest that you do that as well. So if your action bias is driving you to do something, then we would suggest that you revisit that plan that you have. Check your assumptions, review the drivers of achieving your plan, and check your asset allocation. Those are all steps that will contribute to you achieving your goals. Buying the dip because shares are quote-unquote on sale will likely have little impact on your long-term wealth. All right, Shani, we made it. That was a short one, which I think people will appreciate. Yeah. Um, so yeah, any final words of wisdom? No, I mean, send a message to Mark about his promotion. I think he'll really like that. So. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's very nice. But also what I would like is any comments you could put in your podcast app or any ratings. So in Spotify, you can now rate the podcast. So that would be great. I think we'd both appreciate that. And of course you can send an emails to my email address, which is in the show notes. And tonight, Shawnee is taking me out for a drink. I am. So I'm looking to forward to that. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm looking forward to that. And if something exciting happens, we'll we can know. talk about yeah. it on next week's podcast. <laughs> Any advice in this podcast is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives situations or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.